personally very happy that the topic is what it is. I think that it's one of the most important topics that we need to consistently remember. And it's a topic which is oftentimes overlooked, especially the importance of this topic. Remember me, I will remember you. Uh, this title comes from a statement in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, Askuruni askurkum. Uh, Allah is saying, remember me and I will remember you. Now, there's a lot of reasons to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm going to proceed to talk about those reasons. Uh, I'm going to talk about the power of dhikr and why it is that we should incorporate dhikr in our lives very, very seriously. However, of all the reasons to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think that the most important and most powerful reason is found within this title. And that is this, Allah is saying that if you remember Him, He will remember you. I want you guys to reflect about that for a second. Can you imagine, not even, you know, think about a king, think about a queen, think about a president, all right? We're not, not, a, not even a law right now, just a king, a queen, or a president. Imagine that person, that famous person, that powerful individual coming up and giving an address, right? Speaking to the nation. And in their speech, they mention you. In their speech, they say, they give you a shout out, right? They give you, they, they remember you by name. Oh, and by the way, I want to give a special, you know, thank, reference or thank you or remembrance to so and so. Can you imagine what that would feel like? That a famous person, especially a person of power, yeah, is remembering you. And not just remembering you, but mentioning you in a public gathering. Okay, everyone understand? How would that feel if the king is mentioning you in a public gathering? And not just a gathering, but a gathering of officials. Okay, officials and powerful officials. And this king or this queen is mentioning you. How do you feel about that? Right? Now I want to tell you something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says that if we remember him, he remembers us. And not only does he remember us, we're told that when we mention Allah in a gathering, what are we doing right now? We're in a gathering and we're remembering Allah, yeah? Do you know what Allah says about that? Allah says that when you remember Allah in a gathering, when you mention Him in a gathering, He will mention you in a greater gathering. You know what the gathering of Allah is? It's not just officials. It's not just officials. It's not just politicians or people who have some worldly power. His gathering is the gathering of angels. So Allah is telling us that when we mention Him in our gathering, He mentions us in His gathering. And that's the gathering of angels. We're told that when a people come together and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels sit with them. So we're told that the angels come and sit with that gathering who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only do they sit, but they fill the area between the heavens and the earth. And then those people are then mentioned to Allah, although Allah knows that they are remembering you. They are asking you for this. They are seeking your forgiveness. And it's so powerful to remember Allah that we're told that there was so-and-so person who was a sinner. Who was a sinner. We all are sinners. This person was a sinner and he came and just joined that gathering because he was like just passing through. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that that person is also forgiven. Just because the people who sit in such a gathering will not suffer. Do you understand the power of dhikr? This is this is dhikr on a gather in, in 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 terms of a gathering, yeah. Now I want to talk now about 
our individual dhikr as well, and why it is so powerful and so essential to our survival. If I ask you this question, what do you need to stay alive? What is absolutely the bare minimum requirement for you to continue to stay alive? What would you say? It wouldn't take a doctor to know the answer. What's the, what's the answer? Air, oxygen. Everyone agree? See, you might say food, but when you fast, you can go 16 hours without food and you don't die. People can go even more and they won't die. Yes, they will start to become weak first, but you don't die immediately as soon as you go without food. However, if you go five minutes without oxygen, or 10 minutes without oxygen, that's it. Oxygen is absolutely essential for your survival, just for you to stay alive. I want you to realize that dhikr, your remembrance of Allah is just like oxygen. It is not something you can go without and survive. And a person who does not remember Allah may look like they're still alive, but in fact they are dead. And internally they are dead. And that's the real kind of death. See, there is physical death and there is spiritual death, okay? Physical death is what? That the heart stops beating, a person stops breathing, the body is dead. But as we know, physical death is not actual complete death, is it? Because the soul continues, right? So even when the body dies, the soul does not. The soul moves on to another realm. And we, we know that that realm that the soul goes is called a barzakh. And that's the, the grave and the time in between this world and the next. Everybody follow? So it's only the body that's dying, right? The soul does not die, the soul moves on, okay? So the real death, the real death is not the death of the body. The real death is the death of the heart when it does not remember Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that the difference between the one who remembers Allah and the one who does not remember Allah is like the difference between the living and the dead. It is absolutely our oxygen. Without the remembrance of Allah, you are dead inside. Even if your body looks like it's alive, but inside you are dead. And this is because you've deprived the heart and the soul of its oxygen. So dhikr itself is keeping us alive. Now what is the most essential form of dhikr? What is the most essential form of dhikr that we're going to be asked about first on the Day of Judgment? Salah. The Prophet ﷺ says that the first thing every person is asked about on the Day of Judgment is the salah. And if that salah is in order, then that person will have succeeded. And if it is not, then that person will have failed. It is very clear that we cannot be successful in this life without the salah. If a person's salah is not in order, that person will fail. And there is no two ways about it. That's absolutely a reality. A person needs their salah to be able to continue to go through this journey and be successful. So anyone who tries to tell you that this is the way to get to Allah and it does not involve the Salah, then they're not telling you the truth. Any kind of fancy spirituality, any kind of fancy shaykh, all of these kinds of things, if they don't involve the Salah, if it is not grounded in Salah, without Salah, is actually all false. Because the Salah is your oxygen. It's like someone coming to you and saying, hey, I'm gonna train you, right? A personal trainer comes and says, hey, I'm gonna train you, but you're not even breathing. You're not even getting oxygen. How is someone gonna train you if you don't even have oxygen? Make sense? First, you have to be oxygenated, and then you can talk about training, right? So the bare absolute minimum of our life internally is the salah, and the remembrance of Allah through the Salah. Now, before I go on and talk about the other practices of dhikr, I want to tell you about a story 
that emphasizes the importance of the of dhikr in general, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is in Surah Taha. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, see in Surah Taha, Allah tells us in an extended section about the story of Musa alayhi salam. And we know, we learn from this story, from this section, the history of Musa alayhi salam, what happened to him when he was a child. But it begins with the very first introduction of Allah to Musa alayhi salam. When Allah is introducing himself to Musa alayhi salam and speaking to him for the first time, what does Allah say during this conversation? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Musa alayhi salam, he introduces himself. He says, I am your Lord. You know, he's introducing himself, tells him to take off his shoes and tells him where he is. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In many, and Allah la ilaha illa ana fa'abudni wa aqin salata li dikri. Look at what Allah is saying at the very beginning. Intro. This is the intro. You know when someone becomes Muslim and we're kind of like the first thing we say to them. What's the intro that we say to them? Typically it's like you have to change your name, stop celebrating Valentine's Day, and here's a hijab, put it on. Right? We completely skip over the essentials and we go to these other things first. Because we've lost this concept of priorities, right? We've lost the concept of priorities. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is he saying first to Musa alayhi salam? He is saying, he's introducing himself as Allah. In, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِنَّنِي أَنَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا That there is nothing worthy of worship but me. It's Tawheed from the very beginning. This is our foundation. There is nothing worthy of worship but Allah. Now this is a very deep concept because often we don't fully understand the idea of Tawheed. The idea of what is La ilaha illallah mean. What does even the word ilah mean? And sometimes we think it's just like a stone idol that we pray to. Many of us, many of us fall into this trap where I say La ilaha illallah with my tongue. But I take other things and I make them into an ilah. What do I mean by that? I mean we take money as an ilah. And we don't even realize it. We take people as an ilah. We take status as an ilah. We take power as an ilah. Control. Sometimes we take what other people think as an ilah. What do I mean by that? Obviously we're not praying to money. We don't make a statue out of dollar bills and then pray to it. But what does it mean to take something as an ilah? It means that it's the most important thing to me. That's it. Nothing is more important than that. So if I take money and it's the most important thing to me, that's a kind of worship. That means I'm taking money as an ilah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that there are a people who take their hawa as an ilah. Their hawa, what's hawa? Hawa is my own desire, my own inclination, my own thinking. You know when you tell someone about a hadith and they say, oh, but that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah? Or you tell them an ayah, even more. If the ayah says something, this is the words of Allah. And they say, but I think this. Yeah? But I don't agree. <laughs> you understand? What's happening here is that they're taking their own opinions, their own inclination, their own desires, and putting it above what Allah is saying. That's worshipping your desires. That's not worshipping Allah. That's not La ilaha illallah. You understand? La ilaha illallah means there's no other ilah except God. Allah. And Allah is just the Arabic word for God. You can say it in any language. Allah is God, God of all people. It's not just the Muslim God. It's not just the Muslim God. God of all people, all times, the Supreme One Lord. There's nothing worthy of worship but Him. So here, when Allah is talking to Musa alayhi salam, the first thing He's saying to him is that, is that I am Allah and there's nothing worthy of worship but me. So Tawheed, foundation. And then what comes next? What comes next after realizing that I am the only thing, that Allah is the only thing worthy of worship? فَعْبُدْنِي So worship me. 
ibadah. And what comes with that? Wa aqimi salata lidikri. And establish. See the word aqim, it doesn't just mean, see Allah doesn't just say pray. Allah doesn't just say pray. Allah uses a word before pray, which is aqim. And aqim means to establish something. In the Arabic language, it's like the same word you say to stand, right? To stand, to be firm, Allah, to establish yourself. Because when you stand up, you're establishing yourself, standing up. Allah's saying, establish salah, lidhikri, for my remembrance. Salah is not just supposed to be done. See? See, if Allah just told us pray, if it was just about praying, then maybe it could be done once in a while and left some of the time. Yeah? Or when I when it's when it's when it's convenient, I pray. When it's not convenient and I'm at an airport, I don't pray, you know? When when it when it's when it's uh, everyone else is praying, I get up and pray. But when it's embarrassing or no one else is doing it, I don't. When I'm happy, I pray. When I'm sad, I don't. You get it? That's not iqam is salah. That's not establishing salah. That's praying whenever I feel like it, right? That's that's just being moody about it. Establishment of salah means that it is something firm, that no matter what, no matter whether it's convenient or it's not convenient, no matter whether you've gotten enough sleep or you haven't, yeah? no matter whether you're in public or you're in private, no matter whether you're sad or you're happy, rich or you're poor, or you got what you wanted or you didn't, it's an establishment of the salah. That salah is a non-negotiable. It's not something that you do sometimes and you leave sometimes. Now, establishment of salah also is, it means in terms of a societal level. Iqam is salah also means that you need to make institutions like masajid where salah is established. So this is iqam is salah. It's not just praying, but it's establishment of salah. So the first thing, right, in this intro, that Allah, think about this. You're talking to Allah for the first time. Whatever Allah says at the beginning, that's the most important, that's your foundation. And this is the introduction. Allah is establishing Tawheed and He is establishing the Salah. Why? Lidhikri. Wa aqim salata lidhikri. Establish Salah for my remembrance. Allah is showing us and showing Musa salam the importance of dhikr, the importance of the remembrance of Allah and the establishment of salah. Now, after this, Allah has a long conversation with Musa salam. all right? What's interesting is that after this conversation, so, so it begins in this way with Allah emphasizing to Musa salam the establishment of salah and the importance of dhikr and obviously tawheed. But watch what happens. Is that after that, um, Musa salam now is making a dua, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, among other things, Rabbi shahi sadri wa yassirri amri wa ahli raqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. He is being given a very heavy mission. He has to go and speak to Pharaoh. Do you guys know who Pharaoh is? Pharaoh used to kill babies as a policy. Pharaoh used to cut off people's limbs and crucify them. Pharaoh used to stand up and say, Ana rabbukum al I am your Lord most high. Pharaoh is, is the worst human being to walk the earth, basically, okay? That's who he has to approach. That's a heavy mission, isn't it? So he asks Allah for help. Rabbi shrah li sadri, wa yassir li amri, wa ahlul aqdata min lisani yafqahu qawmi. Rabbi shrah li sadri, O oh Allah, expand my chest. Wa yassir li amri, make my matters easy for me. Take the knot out of my tongue that they may understand my speech. Now he also asks Allah to give him his brother as a support. He asks for the support of Harun. Now in that dua, what does he say? He says, give, he's asking for the support of Harun, and then he says, why? Why? So that we can exalt you a lot and remember you a lot. That's the reason. He's saying that this is the goal. This is the goal. He's saying give me the support 
in order that we may exalt you a lot and remember you a lot. Notice that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dhikr in the Quran, Allah doesn't just tell us. Remember I said Allah doesn't just tell us to pray? Allah tells us to establish salah. Iqam is salah, not just salah. Okay. When Allah tells us to remember him, when Allah talks about dhikr, Allah doesn't just tell us to remember him. He says, remember him a lot. He says, remember him a lot. When he describes the believers, he says, Yathkurullah kathira. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds a lot. So Allah is telling us that dhikr is not just something that you do a little bit or once in a while, but dhikr must be done a lot. It's like a doctor who says, breathe once in a while. Yeah? Obviously, that's not going to work out, right? You can't breathe once in a while. You have to breathe a lot. You get it? In fact, we breathe every what? How many seconds? How many breaths do we take in a minute? You understand? So the, the point is that breathing needs to be done a lot. And we understand that. It's the same thing with dhikr. Because it is our oxygen. So Allah tells us, don't just do it. Do it a lot. It has to be a lot. One thing I, I recognize um, about myself is that, you know, growing up, if you're semi-practicing, you, maybe you pray. Alhamdulillah, you pray. But when that's, I, I notice that when that's all you do, if you're only praying, that's it. But alhamdulillah, at least you're staying alive, bare minimum. But one thing I notice is that when you only pray and you don't remember Allah outside of that, you don't do your afkar, you don't read Quran, what happens is you become like a person who's, okay, they're still alive, but the oxygen level in their blood is very low. They are still, their heart is still beating, they are still, you know, have a pulse, but you know you go to a doctor and they can test your oxygen level, right, in your blood. There's different percentages. And their oxygen level is low. It's not 100, it's not 98, but it's very, it's, it's somewhere low enough to stay alive, but not high enough to be strong. Not high enough to be, you know, to have that, that light, that energy. Make sense? This is what happens when you have the bare minimum, but not enough dhikr. Because dhikr at the end of the day is meant to be a lot. It is meant to be a lot. And that's just like oxygen is meant to be a lot. Because that's how you stay alive and healthy. Okay? Now one thing you'll notice is that after this conversation or into this conversation with Musa alayhi salam, what does Allah say to him at the end or towards the end of the conversation? He says, Adhib anta wa akhuka bi ayati wa la taniya fi dhikri. He's telling him, go with your brother. So he got his dua, he, got, he gave him his brother as a support. He said, go with your brother with my signs. And then this is the part I want to emphasize. وَلَا تَنِيَا fi dhikri. Look at what Allah is saying. Allah began by saying, establish the salah for my remembrance. And then Allah ends with saying, do not become weak in my remembrance. وَلَا تَنِيَا fi dhikri. Means, means, do not slacken in my dhikr. Do not slacken in my dhikr. Do not become weak in my dhikr. See, He's not just telling him, don't forget me. Because Musa is not going to forget about Allah. Once you, you know, you have a conversation with God, you're not going to forget about it. Yeah? But he's not saying, just don't forget about me. He's saying, do not become weak or slacken in my remembrance. Here's the thing, guys. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot that we have to do. If you think about an Olympic athlete, an Olympic athlete has a lot of of, of activity to do, right? They have a lot that they have to overcome, and there's a lot that they have, they have to perform, right? At a very high level. It is even more important for an athlete to get good oxygen, right? See, one thing you'll find is like, athletes, they, you know, they, when you're playing or when you're working out, what's happening to your breathing? It increases. You know when you run, 
What happens to your breathing? <sighs> right? What's, what is that? That's because you're breathing more. You're actually taking in more breaths per minute. Why? Because you need more oxygen to be able to, to perform at that level. Because you're exerting a lot. Does that make sense? And it's the same thing in our life. The more that a person has in terms of their, their performance, that they have, they want to be closer to Allah. They have more to do. See, the most were the prophets. The prophets, peace be upon them. Because they had such a heavy job. They were the, the, they were the Olympic athletes, you know? And so they had to get more oxygen. When the Prophet ﷺ was given his message, what is the first thing that Allah told him to do? In the beginning of the revelation, towards the very beginning of the revelation, you have Surah Al-Muzammil and Surah Al-Muddathir. What is Allah telling uh, the Prophet ﷺ? He's telling him to stand and pray at night. To stand and pray at night. Why? Because you got a lot to do in the day. Do you understand? So the time at night, he is being told to pray at night. Why? Because that's his oxygen. That's his fuel to be able to do what he needs to do. And it was a lot that he needed to do. It was a heavy mission. It was heavy work. He is, you know, the, the, the gold medalist, right? And so he has to have that training and that oxygen at night through dhikr, through increased remembrance of Allah. Now I'm going to tell you guys this. We may not be gold medalists, but every single one of us have a lot of work. And I'm going to tell you why. Even if we're not, we're not, obviously we're not messengers, we're not uh, da'is even. Even if we're not going out and teaching people, we're not shuyukh. But I'll tell you what every single person is doing. Every single person is in a constant battle that they don't actually see. You and I, no matter who we are, no matter what job we have, no matter what position we're in, we are in a constant battle. We are on a battlefield every single minute against all the unseen forces that want to take us to hell. Do you understand? And, uh, and this is something Allah warns us in the Quran again and again and again. That shaitan is an enemy to us. Shaitan is an open enemy. So take him as an enemy. Allah is warning us. Don't think that you're ever just chilling. You're just sitting. You're not. You're always in a battle. And it's an unseen battle. It's an unseen battle. Now, I'm not even yet talking about the seen battle. Yeah? There is there's a whole other battle that we that we fight that we see. You know, the, the issues with the people, Islamophobia, or the issues we deal with other people, relationship issues, financially. I'm not even talking about the seen battle. I'm talking just right now about the unseen battle. That even if you y'all are just doing wonderful, yeah, and there are no problems, which is impossible. But even if there were no problems in your scene, in your physical, in your in the scene world, you still have this battle that's happening in the unseen, and it's constant. It's constant. So you need you need to be fueling yourself, and you need to be protecting yourself, or else you do get you will get overtaken. You will get you will get knocked down. You will get destroyed. So if a person just thinks, oh no, I'm I'm fine, and they, they kind of put it on autopilot, and they're not. It's like, when, when does an enemy take over? When does an enemy, you know, win? Is when you, you kind of like stop being on your guard, right? When you stop being on your guard, that's when the enemy can win. This is part of our guard to, to, to be able to handle this, this constant battle that we're in. This constant battle. So now, Allah is saying to Musa alayhi salam, because you know what? Musa has a really, really hard job. And there's no way that he could or anyone can handle this type of job without the remembrance of Allah. 
and a lot of it. That's why he's saying do not become weak in it. Do not slacken in it. It's actually not enough just to remember Allah a little. It's not enough. It's like just breathe a little. You can't. You have to breathe a lot. And so it has to be something that is established within your day and within your life in a very intense and consistent way. Or you will see the consequences. And it's not it's not like we're doing Allah a favor, guys. We're not doing Allah a favor by remembering Him. You realize that? That's like saying that you're doing the doctor a favor by breathing. You don't affect the doctor whether you breathe or you choose not to breathe, right? Who do you affect if you choose not to breathe? Yourself. And that's it. You get it? So our dhikr is for us. Our dhikr is for me. It's keeping me alive. It's not doing Allah a favor. It's not making Allah rich because Allah is the most rich. He doesn't actually need any of us to remember Him or anything from us. He is rich. What Allah is doing is He's showing us, He's teaching us how to take care of ourselves, how to stay alive, and then not just stay alive, but be very strong. So here's how you have to think about it. With your body, you need oxygen just to maintain life, yeah? But then to be stronger, you need more oxygen. And then, well, okay, imagine someone's breathing and everything's fine, but they're not eating much. They're not getting enough food. What's going to happen to that person's abilities? It's going to be weaker. Yes, they're going to be alive, but they're going to be weaker. They need more food to be stronger. Now imagine they're getting enough food, but it's junk food. It's like really unhealthy. Okay, they may still be able to function, but not at the same level as someone who's eating organic, right? And who's taking their vitamins and their minerals and never takes any preservatives and all that stuff, yeah? What's happening is the spiritually, it's the same thing. That the more we take care of ourselves spiritually, the healthier we're gonna be spiritually. And then when we're healthier spiritually, then it shows up in our life. It shows up in how we act. It shows up in our relationships. It shows up in everything that we do. Because Allah, the Prophet said, in Indeed, in the body, there's a lump of flesh. If it is set right, the entire body is set right. And if it is corrupted, And if it is corrupted, the entire body is corrupted. Indeed, it is the heart. When we take care of the heart, through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will be able to be healthier. We will be able to be those, you know, those athletes that perform at a very high level. Now, um, I want to go on and just give you some of the benefits of the dhikr and then tell you some of the dangers of leaving dhikr but before I do that I'm going to give you a break because we've been talking for a long time aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru lahu li wa lakum innahu ghafurur rahim subhanakallahu wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل رقبة من لساني يقرأ قولي. As some of you might have seen, uh, these are exciting days. الحمد لله. I just launched my new book and actually uh, Malaysia. Is one of the first to actually to have a chance to get the book. It's it's not available online. In fact, it's not available anywhere uh, yet. Except I do have some copies, limited copies here. Uh, it's called Love and Happiness, and I just wanted to read the introduction to sort of it, it. It explains a bit about what the book is about and why I wrote it. Okay, everyone ready? All right. Things fall apart, and they break sometimes. Like many of you, my journey hasn't always been easy. 
pain is very real, and so is loss. Sometimes it's hard not to let the weight of what we carry or the memory of what we've lost take over. Many of us know the reality of struggle, and so many people suffer in silence. It's hard. It's hard not to give up when we face the repeated disappointments of life. Like some of you, I've known loneliness. I've known defeat. I've fallen many times chasing mirages and broken many bones, making castles in life's fading sands. Sometimes all it took was one solid wave to destroy what I had spent years building. So I decided to give it a voice, all of it, the tears, the pain, and the lessons. The things that I saw and learned and gained along my life path needed a voice. I wanted to give back in hopes of helping myself and others survive. But then it wasn't just about surviving. I didn't just want people to survive inside their storms. I wanted people to thrive inside their storms. And so I wrote as I walked through my own. The words found in this book became my voice and my letter to the world. They became my deepest attempt to not just pick myself up, but others along the way. I wrote because just as we will fall in life, so will we rise. That's the thing about this world. It never gives us only one kind of path. There is pain, yes, and loss, and even darkness. But there is also light. There is hope. There is beauty. And there is also love and happiness. In these next few minutes, I want to talk about some more specific ways in which we are given to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to leave you with a prescription. And this is a prescription which I guarantee will change your life. And you don't have to take my word for it, just try it. Before I give you that prescription, I want to tell you what happens when we turn away from the remembrance of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a few things in the Quran. One of them which Allah tells us, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةٌ ضَنْكَ Allah tells us that whoever turns away from my remembrance, whoever turns away from my remembrance, for him will be a narrow, miserable life. Realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only telling us about a narrow, miserable life in the hereafter, but this person who turns away from the remembrance of Allah will have a narrow, miserable life in this world before the next. That the reality is that true happiness, that true peace can only come in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Allah tells us that indeed in the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find peace and satisfaction. And it is not able, you are not able to find it in anywhere else away from the remembrance of Allah. Now you might say, but what about this person and that person, you know, this rich person or this celebrity or this famous person, they seem happy, right? They're not even Muslim and they seem happy. Now, here's what we have to understand. There is happiness of cattle. Happiness of cattle comes how? They eat, they sleep, and they reproduce, and they're happy. Right? The ha 
Lavash curry. Anyone know what that means? The happy cow. Okay? It's a kind of cheese. It's French. But the point is that cows can be happy too. But how does a cow be happy? By eating. As long as a cow eats and sleeps and drinks and reproduces or basically is, you know, um, if, the, if, if he has the desire to reproduce, he obeys that desire, he's happy. And that's it. There is nothing higher. There is no higher form of happiness for an animal. So for a human being, there are two kinds of pleasure. There is the physical pleasure, which is the same as an animal's pleasure. Where I ate, you know, I had some good beef rundung, and I was happy, right? I haven't had good beef rundung yet, but I'm waiting, inshallah. And I, so I'm happy, right? My stomach is happy. But that happiness is a lower level happiness. It's, it's a pleasure, but it's a physical lower kind of pleasure. Very similar to the animalistic type of pleasure. There's no difference, okay? You know, intimacy. There is a physical pleasure to that, which also an animal experiences, right? But as human beings, we have a higher level potential, a higher level pleasure or happiness that an animal doesn't have. And that is the pleasure and the happiness that comes through knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only in the remembrance of Allah do you find that higher level happiness. And you cannot find that higher level happiness in anything else. No matter how much money you have, no matter, no matter how much power you have, no matter what kind of physical type of pleasure you have, it will never be that higher level happiness. That contentment. And that higher level contentment, that, that peace, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Qur'an. Ya ayyatuhu nafsu mutma'inna. When Allah tells us there are different kinds of souls, there is a nafsu mutma'inna, and Allah describes how he calls to this type of soul at death. Surah Al-Fajr, Allah says, and he calls out to this type of soul, Ya ayyatuhu nafsu mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Allah calls out to this type of soul. Nafsul mutma'inna is the soul that is at peace. It is a soul that has peace and satisfaction because that soul was close to Allah. This is a specific kind of soul. And this nafsul mutma'inna, it is irregardless of how much money they had, how much power they had, how much status. It, it's completely irregard, it's completely separate to what they look like, to anything they own. It is something completely separate. And that type of happiness, that type of peace, only comes from the remembrance of Allah. So Allah calls out to those souls at death, Ya ayyatuha nafsu mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya. Allah is telling these souls to come back. To come back. Allah is, you know, the word that's used here is irji'i. Now, in the Arabic language, you can say, you can use a different word for coming. Like, 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 idhab, idhab would mean to go, yeah? The command of go. But Allah doesn't say go. Allah says irji'a. Irji'i means come back. So it's somewhere that you were already there, you know, and then you went away and, you, and you're coming back. So these souls aren't just going to Allah, they're coming back home. Make sense? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, come back. Because that's actually where we belong. It's where we, where we in fact belong. Dunya was never the home for these souls. Dunya was never the actual home. It's like right now, I'm traveling, right? I don't live in Malaysia. I am visiting Malaysia. My home is in the U.S. And so when I go back to the U.S., I am going back home, right? This life 
is just a stop in a path. The Prophet ﷺ said, what am I in this life but a traveler who stops like a traveler who stops in the shade of a tree for a while and then continues in his journey. This life is not our home. It's a temporary stop. And so Allah says to these souls who were in peace and tranquility, why? Because they were the people of dhikr. They were those who remembered Allah in this life. And so they are the ones Allah is referring to as an nafsul mutma'inna. They are the souls at peace because they remembered Allah in this life. And know something about remembrance. Sometimes people believe that they can just live their life however they want. Live their life, you know, some people have this idea of live it up, you know, YOLO. YOLO is, stands for you only live once. So these, this concept of YOLO is like, you just have one life, so just try to maximize physical pleasure. You know, do whatever you want, because you only live once. This idea that you can just live however you want, and then we have like a Muslim spin to it, which is, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll wear hijab when I'm old, or I'll, I'll, fix, I'll live however I want, and then I'll go for hajj when I'm 95, and then, you know, I'll repent. Or, or I'll live however I want, and as, I'll just say la ilaha illallah when I die. You know, it's just like, as if it's so easy to say la ilaha illallah when you die. As if la ilaha illallah just slips off the tongue at death for anyone. And that's not the truth. The truth is, and I'm sure many of you have heard of experiences like this, where a person is at their deathbed and they cannot say la ilaha illallah. Their families are begging them, repeat, say la ilaha illallah, and they can't say it. And do you know why that happens? Because they never lived it. Yeah? They didn't live la ilaha illallah, so they can't say it when they're dying. And that's all that matters is what you do when you die. Yeah? So death, death is a reflection of your life. If you live, if you live in the remembrance of Allah, you'll be able to die in the remembrance of Allah. <coughs> but believe me, if you don't remember Allah while you're alive, you will not be able to remember Him when you die. And that is the worst, that is the absolute worst kind of loss. There is no greater loss. There is no other thing that matters except that we leave this life in a good state. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says a beautiful dua, and at the end of the dua, it says to Allah, وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يبعثون. And do not disgrace me on the day when everyone's brought back. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ He's asking Allah, do not disgrace me on the day when everyone is brought back. When nothing is going to benefit anyone of wealth or children. You see these things we run after of wealth and children, but those things will not benefit you in reality, right? Like the idea of monopoly money, right? Monopoly money, you play monopoly, you gather money, but it's fake. It doesn't actually have any any actual value. So these things we run after are, are essentially don't have value in and of themselves when we return to Allah. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا مَنُونَ Except for the one who returns to Allah with a heart that is salim, with a heart that is healthy, with a heart that is sound. There's nothing else that's going to benefit you. There's nothing else that's going to matter. How can we return to Allah with a heart that is salim? We have to live a life of dhikr. If we don't live a life of dhikr, then we are depriving our heart of oxygen. And, and a heart that is deprived of oxygen, it dies. It becomes sick and then it dies. And that heart that is sick will return to Allah sick. And at the time of death, that person will not be able to die on la ilaha illallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
protect us from that. That is the worst, absolute worst kind of loss and failure. Allah tells us what real success is. وَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَهْزِ That's it. That's the definition of success. وَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ Whoever barely escapes hellfire, وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ and enters paradise, فَقَدْ فَهْزِ They have indeed succeeded. That's it. That's success. I know we have a lot of definitions of success. I know we have a lot of definitions of success. How rich you are, how you look, who you marry, what status level you are, maybe how light your skin is. I mean, we have all these different definitions. But the true definition of success is whoever escapes hellfire and enters Jannah. That is success. We cannot do that unless we are remembering Allah and remembering Him a lot. Now, I want to leave you guys with something that you can take home and implement it in your life, inshallah, and you see your life change. You will absolutely see your life transform. And that's something that I call Dhikr Challenge. It has three parts. Okay, number one is the Salah. I spoke about already the importance of the Salah as the oxygen of our heart. Salah cannot be something that you do once in a while. It cannot be something you only do when it's convenient. Nobody says, I was in the meeting, so I'm going to breathe tonight. No one says, I didn't have time to breathe. Right? No one says, I was in a bad mood, so I didn't breathe. Or I'm studying for an exam, so let me breathe tomorrow. Yeah? It's not going to work out. That's not something we say, and we know that we cannot do that. Similarly, the, the salah is just basic oxygen, and it has to be a non-negotiable. The same way you can leave a meeting to go use the bathroom, you can leave a meeting to go pray. There is no excuse to miss your salah. Even if a person is paralyzed, may Allah protect us. And the only thing they can move is their eyes, they can pray with their eyes. If the only thing you can move is your pinky, then you pray with your pinky. Understand? There's no, as long as you are conscious, there is no excuse for not praying. The second is the azkar. Now the afkar I mentioned to you before that the remembrance of Allah is not enough to be just once in a while a little bit. The afkar are the supplications that the Prophet used to say throughout his day. And if you want a collection of these afkar, there is many apps that you can get on your phone. One of them, My Dua or Fortress of a Muslim, has a collection of duas. And what you need to do is this. There are a few times of the day where you absolutely cannot live without those afkar. One of them is morning afkar. That means after praying Fajr on time. By the way, I want to just point something out about Salah. Salah is not just any time you've, you have in the day. For example, if I gave you as a doctor, I gave you a prescription because I told you that you are very ill and you need this medicine to stay alive. But I also told you that it has to be taken at exactly this time in the day, and then again at this time, and again at this time, and I gave you five doses, and I said they have to be at a specific time of day. What are you gonna do? You're gonna take it, and you're gonna take it on time. What you will not do is say, well, um, I was at the mall, so I just decided to skip two doses. Or I was, I was driving, so I ended up taking all five doses before I slept. Get it? It doesn't work like that. It's medicine. You have to take it as the doctor prescribes. Make sense? Allah's high above any analogy, but Allah has given us a prescription, and Wallahi, Allah knows what He's doing. Just like you trust the doctor, why? The doctor knows what He's doing, right? I don't want to die. I, want, I don't want to die. I'm not going to mess with medicine. Allah knows what he's doing. When he says fajr is at a specific time, it's at that time. It's not just whenever I wake up. It's not just whenever it's convenient. So after fajr salah, you open up your app and you click on morning supplications. Read through them. 
know what you're saying. Don't just read it, but know the meaning. It's written there also in the app. Then after Asr prayer, open your app again and read evening supplications. Click on evening supplications. Read them. And then before you sleep, read the du'as for sleep. These three are like bare minimum, okay? But there are more. And the more that you remember Allah, the more your heart will be healthy and alive. And the better your life will be. And the easier your life will be. Wallahi. It's for your own good. Remember, you're not making Allah rich. You're not making Allah rich. You're making yourself rich. So the afkar, the Prophet ﷺ has a supplication for everything in life. Everything. He leaving the house, there's a supplication. Coming back, there's a supplication. Eating, entering the bathroom, intimacy, everything. New clothes, driving, traveling. You get it? The more you can say these things, the healthier your heart will be and the better your life will be and the easier and more blessed. Make sense? Okay. One other thing I'm going to add in part two, I said of God was number two. First was Salah and then of God. Something else I'm going to add in, uh, in part two is Dua. This is part of your of God. Constantly, as much as you can, be in conversation with Allah. It doesn't have to be in Arabic. It doesn't have to be in any specific language. Speak to Allah in whatever language you want, and it doesn't have to be out loud. It can be in your heart. It's a conversation with the most hearing. He can hear you. And he's an Ali. He understands you, okay? He understands and he can hear everything. Even what you yourself don't know, he knows, right? About yourself. He knows what is hidden in the subconscious. So don't think that Allah doesn't understand unless you're speaking in a specific words in, in a different language. Okay? So dua can be in whatever language. Um, also within the afqad, I want to just tell you that there are certain openings. Remember I said that we are on a constant battlefield in the unseen? Shaitan has vowed to attack us on the straight path. Shaitan says, in the Quran is quoted to have said that I will attack them from their front and from their back and from their right and from their left. The shaitan is trying to come at us from every direction. So what we have to do and the only protection we have is to close these openings of the shaitan. Every single day there are certain openings to the shayati, bigger openings. So if you think about it, Right now, this room has a few doors, right? There's a door there, there's a door there, there's a door there, yeah? If I don't want the robber to come in, what do I have to do to the doors? Shut them, right? Obviously. But what if I go to sleep at night, I leave my doors open, I leave my windows open, and then in the morning, I wonder why did the robber come in and steal everything? Well, it's my own fault, right? Because I didn't even shut the doors. I didn't even close the window. This is what we do with shaitan. We leave the doors open, and then we wonder why we have so many issues, okay? So we have to shut these doors. How do we shut these doors? There's a few times when the doors are open to the shayateen throughout the day, and the Prophet ﷺ teaches us how to close those doors. First, when you eat, say bismillah. Remember Allah, say the dua when you eat, because the Prophet ﷺ said, if you don't remember Allah when you eat, the shaitan eats with you. It's an opening. When you enter your house, the Prophet said, said, if you don't remember Allah, the shaitan enters with you. So say your dua when you enter the house. Remember Allah entering the house. That's closing that door. When you enter the bathroom, okay, same thing. Say the dua, that's an, also an opening for the shaitan. The morning, the, the sunrise and the sunset, those are the morning and evening of God. Those are doors that you need to shut. Intimacy is another door. And so you say the dua that closes that door, right? All of these things will be fortifying you. So we said what? Entering the house, eating, entering the bathroom, intimacy, also leaving the house. We, there's a dua for protection when you're going out. These, all these things will help close these openings. And then morning and evening, as we know from the, the hadith, that the, these are also openings for the shatin at sunrise and sunset. Okay? So that's all part of the afqar. Everyone following? Awesome. Number three is Qur'an. 
that we have to have a consistent relationship with Quran, not only reading it, but also understanding and implementing it to the best of our ability, okay? Um, I wanna just add something else, and that is the importance of, this, this fits in number two, but I wanna give it special emphasis, the importance of istighfar, of repentance. Um, no one says, I don't need to repent, or sorry, I don't need to take a shower today because I did that in October. <laughs> if, if a person only takes a shower in October, or once a year, or twice a year, or maybe only in the month of Ramadan, they're gonna smell really, really bad. And they're actually gonna get sick because of all the dirt and germs, right? Istighfar is like taking a shower. It's cleaning the body. It's cleaning the heart, rather. Istighfar is something we have to do daily. We have to, the Prophet Sallallahu would make istighfar a hundred times a day. And he was so he was not a sin, he didn't have sins. Istighfar is something we have to do excessively and there's a hadith that says the more you make istighfar, the more things open for you in your life. Difficulties become easier. Yeah, things which are closed will open. Allah increases you in blessings and, and, and provision. All of these things come from istighfar, repentance. A lot of repentance. That cleaning is extremely powerful. Okay. So what are the three things? Number one, salah. Number two, afkar. That we said you can get the app or you can get Fortress of a Muslim. Number three, Quran. If you do these three things, your life actually changes. Your, your mental state changes. Your emotional state changes. Your spiritual state changes. Your, your relationships change. It's actually extremely transformative. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to remember Him and remember Him a lot. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all the difficulties that people face easy. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to die on La ilaha illallah, aqulin qawli hadha, wa astaghfar Allah li wa lakum, inna huwa khunur rahim, subhanak Allah bihamdak, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruk wa atubu layk. I will take uh, a few minutes to open it up for questions, if anyone has. Yes. <coughs> Just try to speak loud and I'll repeat here. My name is Daniel. I'm an expert in the myself. Uh, that's my question to anyone. This is like asking your opinion on what the festival does. Okay, great question. She's asking, uh, she introduced herself, she's a professor, and she's saying how does uh, how does work fit into ibadah? What is the meaning of ibadah and then how does work fit into that? It's a great question. Ibadah, in and of itself, the concept of ibadah is bigger than just prayer. Ibadah is is translated loosely as worship, but it's bigger than only praying and fasting. Ibadah is anything that we do, there's a few like conditions, okay? Anything we do with the intention, the right intention for the pleasure of Allah, according to the way in which we are told by Allah and His Messenger. So there's two things that you need for it to be ibadah, one is proper intention, and two is doing the proper thing, okay? Because I might say, well, my intention is to please Allah, so I decided to make maghrib five rakahs. That's not ibadah. Even if my intention is good, but the way I'm doing it is not according to the sunnah. Make sense? So this is called bid'ah, right? This is an innovation. Also, I may be praying properly, but my intention is wrong. My intention is showing off, for example. May Allah protect us. Riyah. So, you have to have both. Now, anything that has both of those components, the proper intention and done according to what Allah and His Messenger have given us, can be considered ibadah. For example, you mentioned work. Yeah. So, suppose a person is working, and number one, their intention is good in their work. For example, 
Um, one of the responsibilities of a man is to take care of his family. This is actually an obligation by God upon the man, is to take care and to maintain the family, to protect and maintain the family. So his work can be ibadah, because what he's doing is, he is obeying the commandment of Allah. As long as it is done with the right intention and in the right way. I can't say, okay, I'm gonna obey this commandment, but I'm going to sell alcohol, and then that's how I'm gonna support my family. Again, it has to be both. Okay. Similarly, even obviously women as well, even though it's not an obligation on women to support her family, but the money that she makes, and if she gives that money, even uses that money for her family, this is like a salaka. This is a charity that she's doing. So again, she can be rewarded for that as ibadah, etc. And so anything we do, even sleep, if done in the right way and for the right intention, can be ibadah, can be worship. Why? I'll tell you. Suppose that a person is saying, you know, like for example, it's getting late, right? And they say, okay, I need to sleep now, otherwise I won't be able to wake up for Fajr. So now their intention of sleep is part of their worship because they're doing it for the sake of Allah. So yes, worship in and of itself is not just something that we do in the masjid or in praying, but anything that we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to what Allah and His Messenger have given us. Yes. Great question. How do you stay focused and you know in your worship of Allah while maintaining your busy schedule and you know you have so many different roles? That's a very good question. Actually, there's I think it's on online, but I have a whole talk about this exact question about balancing the roles. Someone's heard it? I heard some nodding. Okay, so it is online. And it's like an hour long or something. But to make it short. One thing that you'll find is this question is very related to the topic I just spoke about. What you will find is that when you give time to Allah, so for example, you carve out time to do these of God, what you will find as a result is that Allah will give you blessing in the rest of your day. Meaning, for example, who's the creator of time? Not a trick question, guys. Allah, okay? Allah is the creator of time, which means Allah can expand or contract time. It's not something that controls Allah, Allah controls it. When you are a person of dhikr, when you are a person who remembers Allah a lot, one of the consequences of dhikr is that you have more blessing in your time. This means that in one hour, you're able to do what someone else does in five hours. And there's by the way, these scholars of the past, when people look at these scholars and the work that they came out with, it's like you, it doesn't even add up. It's like not possible to have this much, to have this many books that they wrote in the amount of time that they were alive. Like basically, it doesn't even add up. But it's because of their dhikr. It's because that they gave time to excessively remember Allah that Allah made the rest of their time go further. And they were able to do more in less time and with more ease. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes what He wants easy. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla. Wa anta taj'al al-hazna idha shi'ta sahla. This is one of the afkar. And it means, oh Allah, nothing is easy except what you make easy. And if you will, you can make what is difficult easy. This is the this is the, the secret. The secret is when you make Allah your focus, He takes care of your other matters and makes them easier for you. Well, this is the truth. You know, there's a hadith so powerful in which the Prophet ﷺ talks about two groups of people. And he says that there are two different <coughs> focuses, worldviews, all right? One is a group of people who make this life their primary concern, meaning it's their focal point. Akbar hamma, right? Their, their greatest concern is dunya. And he says there are three consequences to that. First is that this person's matters become scattered. This is a very, very deep concept. 
That his matters become scattered. You know when you just feel scattered? Like you, you're a chicken with the head cut off, you know what I mean? You got this job, you got that job, and you feel like this, you know, you're trying to fix things here, and then this breaks, and then trying to fix, you know what I mean? You can't please, you please this person, this person's upset, you feel me? I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, especially as women, yeah? We're like all over the place. We have to be a million things to a million people. It's, it's, like, it's like a superhero to do this, to do the kinds of, the number of jobs that we have to do, and we have to do each one perfectly, you know what I mean? And we have to look perfect too, right? Along the way. So this is like a lot, yeah? But sometimes we feel scattered. We feel like we can't do it. We feel like everything is, 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 is like breaking, and it's scattered. I feel internally scattered. My life feels scattered. This is a consequence of having the wrong focus. That's what the Prophet said, and it's a secret. But it's, it's like, if your focus is this life, this is a consequence, is that you will actually become scattered. The second consequence of making this life your primary concern, very deep, that poverty is put between his eyes. Do you know what it means to have poverty between your eyes? See, imagine for a moment if I had something hanging or stuck right there. If I look this way, what do I see? That thing. If I turn this way, what do I see? That thing. If I turn this way, what? No matter which way I look, I only see that. When poverty is stuck between your eyes, you always feel poor. You never, ever, ever have enough. Make sense? You know this attitude of, you, you know, you get the, the new iPhone, but then you're waiting on the next one, right? It's just never enough. You have this car, but there's always a better car, right? You have this wife, but there's always a better wife. You know what I'm saying? The idea is that there is no contentment. You always feel poor. You feel not enough. It's not enough. It's never enough. This is a consequence of making dunya your primary concern. You will actually never have contentment. You will always feel poor, no matter how much you have. No matter how much you have, it's never going to make you feel rich. You'll always feel poor. poverty. And third, the person who makes this life their primary concern, nothing of dunya will come to him except what was written anyways. You see, you can spend your life running after it, like a gerbil wheel, you know? You know what treadmill? Treadmill, right? People run and they huff and they puff, but they're not going anywhere. They're just getting tired, right? Are you getting anywhere? Did you go anywhere? No, you stood in the exact same spot. But you're so tired because you are running, but you're not going anywhere. This is a person who runs after dunya. It's like you're just putting in so much effort, right? Blood, sweat, tears, you're hurting yourself, you're stabbing yourself, you're tiring yourself. But in the end, you don't get anything except what was written for you. This is the tragedy of making dunya your primary concern. And then he talks about another group of people, those who make the hereafter their primary concern. And he says that for those people, Allah amra. The opposite happens. Allah joins his affairs. Allah takes care of these, you know the scattered stuff? Allah takes care of it. Allah joins it, very deep concept. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffices you, you know when Allah takes care of it? There's like 10 million things, there's no way that you can do it all. There's no way. And if you try, you're just going to split yourself into pieces. And all you're going to be is in pieces. Is anyone understanding what I mean? You know, you, like, you need to like cut yourself into like five, 50 different versions of yourself to do all this. But Allah joins it for Allah takes care of it. When you make the akhirah your primary concern. When you make Allah and the hereafter your primary concern, Allah takes care of all these scattered things. All your matters become joined. All right? And second... Remember the poverty? The opposite. Contentment is put in the heart. The person will feel content. Even if they have less than the one who feels poor, but they will feel contentment. This is one of the gifts of having the right focus, is that you will feel contentment. You will be satisfied. That's a gift, by the way. That is absolutely a gift, because that's true happiness. So many people who have money, 
and power and status and all these things we run after and they are miserable. How many celebrities do we see killing themselves, overdosing on drugs? They are living miserable lives. Even though they have, what, dunya, don't they? They have dunya at their fingertips. They have money, they have status, they have everything, power. But they are actually miserable. Why do you think they overdose? Why do you think they commit suicide? Why are they constantly intoxicated? They need to be intoxicated because there's an emptiness inside. It's misery. It's not true happiness. Contentment only comes from having the right focus. And finally, Allah says that the dunya will come to that person, the one who has the right focus, who's focused on Allah and hereafter, the dunya will chase after that person. They don't have to chase the dunya, the dunya comes to them. And the dunya will come to him even if it hates to. Like in Arabic we say bin afia. Basically like against your against dunya's will it will come to that person who has the right focus. I ask you please to keep me and my family in your dua and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and hope we can meet again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.